Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Brehan Academy. Uh, welcome back to the channel. I have a real treat in store for you guys tonight. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be reading from a book called A Story of an Irish Sept. Uh, this book was written in, published, I should say, in 1896. Just a little bit of background. When we say sept in Ireland, what are we talking about? So in my previous videos, I've talked about the concept of the Finney and how the Finney was the kind of primary family group in society. You had the Gelfine, which were the kind of immediate family that descended from a common grandfather. Then you had the Derefine, which were the family that descended from a common great grandfather. And for the purposes of the Brehan law, this was the most important family. And then you had the Irfine, which was all the descendants from a common great great grandfather. So what was a sept? Well, a sept was kind of a confederation of families, all related to each other from some common great ancestor. It doesn't have to be the grandfather, the father, or the great grandfather, but the sept were all the members of a, of a family unit that descended from some great common ancestor. So when we talk about the story of an Irish sept, what we're talking about is the story of a great family um, who descended from a common ancestor and their kind of saga and what did they have to face. And the full title of the book, I think, is um, uh, their character and their struggle to maintain their lands. So what I found really interesting about this book is that it begins in really early times and it charts the story of Ireland, the history of Ireland, just kind of focused on one particular clan, one sept that uh, lived in the west of Ireland in County Clare. Um, so the first part here uh, that I'm going to share with you is the preface and um, the first chapter. And what I'd like to do with this little project here is um, share with you at least the first four, maybe six or seven of these chapters. This will bring us from the earliest times in Ireland all through the nature of society, the culture, their spiritual beliefs, all the way up to the invasion of the, the Danes, the Vikings, and how they were defeated by Brian Baru, okay? Everybody knows this King Brian Baru. Well, the sept that I'm about to talk about is the sept that Brian Baru was descended from. So that's why he's featured in this book. I might go a little bit further then into the invasions of the Anglo-Normans as well. And just depending on how this kind of content is received, how much you guys like it, I might even go even further throughout the rest of the book. Um, I would say like a lot of work goes into this uh, in terms of the researching and the recording, and especially in uh, the video production side of things itself. And um, I really, I'm doing it out of a labor of love, but I really want to share this work with everybody because um, I think it's important. I think there's something really special about um, connecting with this part of our heritage. Um, this project, the Brehan Academy, that I that I created it's not just to kind of focus on some like quaint historical features of Irish history the real passion behind it is to maybe uh you know invoke some kind of a revival of consciousness among people about their early heritage even the music that I use at the start of my videos is um a piece of music that was written and, and recorded by a friend of mine Rowan Murphy and the name of this piece of music is The Great Revival. So I see my role in this is kind of like doing the, the research, going into uh, the old dusty books, um, reading about early Ireland, and then trying to find ways to present that content to a modern audience in a way that's kind of interesting and engaging and in a way that we're more used to. I know that not everybody is going to go back and read these books, so I don't mind doing kind of the hard work uh, and then putting it into a medium that more people will be able to access and uh, understand and hopefully, hopefully enjoy as well. So if you do like this sort of content, please let me know. Let me know in the comments below. 
um like the video please and subscribe to the channel i kind of I, I hate asking for that but the, the main reason is um it tells youtube algorithms that this is good content and it will then more likely show up in the suggestions of other people for videos that they're watching so that will help me out a lot if you can just like like the video hit subscribe if you want to see more of this content leave a comment below i love reading your comments and and engaging with you there uh since this is live you do have the option to jump onto the chat uh, on the side of this video. Uh, and if you want to support the work, I would really appreciate it um, for the price of a cup of coffee or a beer. Um, you can do that through the super chats there on the on the side panel. Um, there are other ways to support the work as well. If you want to, you can um, buy a t-shirt. <laughs> uh, we have our store over on the website at brehenacademy.org or you can get like a mug like this, pretty cool with the triple spiral on it. This uh, very... A familiar symbol for Irish people that can be found on the front of Newgrange. So that's one way that you can support the work and also get like some little bit of cool uh, merchandise as well. And um, obviously, you can buy um, one of my online courses. I have three online courses. I won't go into the details now, but um, the first one is on early Irish culture and society. So, kind of talks a little bit about what I'm going to cover in these chapters of this book. Um, but broken down into different video lessons. And um, I believe there's about four or five hours of content. There's about four or five hours of content on each of these online courses. The second one then is about Irish mythology. So if that's the thing that you're interested in, uh, I'd recommend you go and check that out. And the third course is personally my favorite, and it's kind of the reason why I started all of this. It's the Brehan Laws of Early Ireland. Uh, initially, I just wanted to make a Brehan Law course and a Brehan Law resource, but on that journey, I realized that there were a lot of like steps along the way or gaps in knowledge that were essential to fill in before we focused on the Brehan Law, because you really need to understand not, not just the culture and the makeup of society, but also the beliefs and aspirations that those people had. And then approaching the law in that mindset, you get a much deeper insight into how these laws worked and why why they work but the cool thing is this book that i'm going to share with you actually covers a lot, lot of this in it as well so um a quick breakdown of what what you can expect right so in the first chapter here we're going to be talking about the origins of this tribe this sept this family group from uh the west of ireland uh, based in county clare and what's interesting here is how the author draws a a parallel with the people of the Basque region of Spain. And he puts forward the idea that, and it's an interesting that he's putting it forward because he's a member of the clan himself. He's a member of the sept that the, the people of the West of Ireland can trace their roots back further than the Celtic invasions uh, to the Basque region of Spain. Uh, and he gives a very interesting like insight into that. The next part, then he talks about the Brehan laws in chapter two and um, the kind of structure of society, the social order. And actually, Bre Brehan law will be referenced all throughout the book. Uh, but at least the chapters that I've read so far, he, he makes reference back to Brehan law. So it's important, again, to lay that foundation early on, just so it makes more sense later when we go deeper into the, uh, the story of this tribe. Uh, the third chapter, then, is going to be about the education at this time in Ireland, he talks about the bards, he talks about military education, also the notion of uh, fosterage, which was a very common custom in Ireland in uh, uh, regards to the rearing of children. Uh, later then, we talk a little bit more about the family unit and the nature of uh, what was a free man, what was a bondsman, uh, land tenure, land ownership, and so on. And this is all setting the stage step by step to introduce you to a great clan, the Dalcassian clan. Um, of which, as I said, Brian Baru is a descendant of. So I'm definitely, I think, I'm definitely going to take the story up as far as uh, Brian Baru and the Battle of Clintarf. And just depending on sort of response that I get, because um, I only want to put this information out if people want it and people actually um, uh, appreciate it and want to, want to hear more of it. If I see that that's the case, then I'm more than happy to keep putting that out. Uh, not, I'll, I'll switch gear and put out some other content, um, maybe more focused on the Brehan Law. So... Uh, actually, I do have another project in the work on the, the, the bards of um, early Ireland. Um, that's taken a long time. The hardest part of this, as I said, is actually putting the videos together. 
and finding the pictures and visuals that complement the, the, the spoken word. Um, a couple of things before I jump into it, uh, just a few caveats. Um, my pronunciation of some of these terms that he uses may not be 100% accurate. Please don't give me a hard time over this. Uh, in some cases, it's the way that he has chosen to spell the word. And in other cases, it's a fact that, you know, I'm not unfortunately fluent in Irish. Uh, and sometimes my brain kind of struggles with the pronunciation. And when I'm in a mid flow of reading a paragraph, I don't want to go back and, and, and keep trying to uh, repeat it till I get it right. So uh, I'm asking for just a little bit of grace on that with some of the pronunciations. The other thing as well, because I can anticipate it in the comments, um, when he talks about the Celtic peoples, um, in modern research, there's a lot of kind of discussion around what does that actually mean? Is it right to say that there was a Celtic people? And I will just remind you that this book was written in 1896. So he's making the best uh, assessment uh, based on the information that he had at the time. And another thing then I'd like to point out is the fact that it was written in 1896, which even though it's a book about history, it makes it a, a historical resource in itself. And with that in mind, we get a kind of insight into the understanding of an Irish man who descended from a very powerful clan, who was writing a book about his own family uh, in a time when Ireland was still under the British crown. And this mightn't seem too important at the beginning, but I think it makes a little bit more sense uh, later on into the book when, well, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but when you see how this clan um, interacted with the, the British, uh, let's say Anglo-Normans to be more precise, and later English and British um, invaders slash nobility. Uh, so there's really a lot in this book, and that's why I'm really excited to share it with you. Um, I've put a lot of work into this video right now, and I think uh, that's all I wanted to say, just as the preface. Let me think. Let me have a look at my notes. Uh, I try to use the best images I can find, and sometimes the image isn't exactly what's being talking, uh, spoken about in the audio. Uh, in some cases, I don't have an image to show of, you know, the early Christian settlements that are now ruins in County Clare or the actual skulls and bones of the people that he's talking about. So wherever possible, I try to use very accurate imagery that, that directly connects to what I'm talking about in the audio. Uh, however, in some cases, I just have to go with um, the next best thing, which hopefully is just going to help you with your imagination and visualization of um, what I'm talking about. So without further ado, here is the preface and chapter one of a story of an Irish sept by Nottage Charles McNamara. Wait, wait, I knew I was forgetting something. If you want, you can actually download a copy of this book from the Brehan Academy resource library. Um, you just need to become a member. That's free to become a basic member um, navigate over to the resource library and look for this, the book called The Story of an Irish Sept. You can download the PDF there. You can read along with me as I'm reading it out, or if you want to just read it yourself, um, that's available for you. I knew I was forgetting something. Jump back over to the video. The story of an Irish sept, their character and struggle to maintain their lands in Clare. Written by a member of the sept, Nottage Charles McNamara and published in 1896. Dedicated by the author to his children. Our deeds still travel with us from afar, and what we have been makes us what we are. George Eliot. Prefatory Note The sept or group of families referred to in the following history were derived from a common ancestor and occupied from the 5th to the 17th century a definite area of land situated in the centre of County Clare. These people were frequently assailed by Norsemen, Anglo-Normans and by the English, but they successfully defended their lands and homes against invaders for 1200 years and were then dispersed but by no means exterminated by Cromwell. Throughout this long period of time the members of this sept remained an almost pure race. They were principally engaged in agriculture and their surroundings varied but little, and that only with the lapse of time. 
until the reign of James I, they lived under the Brehan laws and clung to their traditions of the church founded by St. Patrick in Ireland. The history of a sept placed in circumstances of this kind is not only an interesting study, but may teach us much concerning their character and that of the Irish people, and thus help us to understand the hereditary qualities which to a large extent have moulded their career, and continues to influence the descendants of Celtic Irishmen as individuals and collectively as a nation. In preparing this story for the press I have to acknowledge the great help I have received from the researches of Mr Standish Hayes O'Grady, especially for his work Sylvia Gedelica, and for his valuable translation of McGrath's Triumphs of Turlock, and for his generous assistance on many occasions. To my friend Mr TJ Westrop I beg to return my sincere thanks. His time and pencil have been placed at my disposal with characteristic Celtic sympathy and as an archaeologist, few men have more extensive or accurate knowledge of County Clare. Several of the plates in this work are taken from copies of Mr. Westrop's drawings, which have already appeared in the pages of the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland, and which the Council of the Society have kindly given me permission to reproduce. I have acknowledged in the footnotes to these pages the authorities referred to, and, as a rule, quoted their own words rather than attempt to explain their meaning according to my ideas on the subject. Lastly, I must crave the indulgence of my readers for the imperfections of this work, which has been written during the few leisure hours of a busy and often anxious life. Signed, N.C. McNamara Chapter 1 Origin of the Sept the locality in which the sept lived, boundaries of County Clare, Burren, stock from which the sept were derived, the Iberians, their character, the Basques of Spain, the Celts, their character, and sept derived from Iberians and Celts. Rightly to comprehend the history of the sept whose fortunes we have to follow, it is necessary to know something of the locality in which its members dwelt and of the stock from which they proceeded, for their surroundings doubtless influenced their mental as well as their physical character, and it is equally certain that their congenital qualities had an important share in shaping their history. We shall find that the members of our sept from the early part of the 5th to the middle of the 17th century dwelt in a well-defined district of Clare, a county which until comparatively recent times was isolated from the rest of Ireland. Its southern and eastern boundary being formed by the River Shannon, which, throughout this part of its course, was only fordable at one place, situated below the town of Killaloe. To the north, Clare is separated from Galway by a range of high hills, running from the Shannon westwards towards Galway Bay. Between the extreme western spur of these hills and the bay, is a strip of low-lying swampy land through which the road northward from Clare passed. This low land, as well as the Echty Hills, were in former times covered by a dense forest, rendering them almost impassable. The geographical position of the county was such as to preserve its inhabitants from successful invasion or from being occupied by foreigners until late in the 16th century. Thus, not only did the people of Clare retain their independence, but also had their old Brehan laws and customs for two, if not three centuries after much of the rest of Ireland had been passed into the hands of the Englishmen. The county is divided by the River Fergus into East and West Clare, the greater part of the former being covered by low hills and bogland. But to the southeast of this part of the county, there are a mass of lofty, rugged hills which run down to the Shannon and western shore off Loch Derrick. These hills in former times were covered with forest trees and were known as one of the best hunting districts in Ireland. It was here that Brian Baru lived, his palace of residence being situated on a spur of the hills overlooking the Shannon as it passes out of Loch Derrick, a spot of exceeding beauty and commanding the ford of Killaloe the only weak point in the boundary 
of Clare to the east. The northern part of the western division of Clare is formed by the district of Burren, which Cromwell's general Ludlow refers to as not possessing water sufficient to drown a man in, wood enough to hang a man on, or soil sufficient to bury him in. Burren is, in fact, little more than a series of bare hills, some of them rising a thousand feet above the level of the sea. The sides of these hills are terraced in a remarkable manner and are of light slate colour with patches of exquisitely green grass scattered over their surface. They are, however, intersected with deep valleys forming some of the finest grazing lands in the country. Burren, with all its barrenness, has singular charms. Its northern boundary, formed by Galway Bay, is indented with creeks which run up to the foot of its hills, for a long time the home of numerous smugglers. To the west, the hills of Burren form perpendicular cliffs, against which the Atlantic hurls its mighty waves, a coast which can hardly be equalled for the wildness of grandeur of its scenery, and which has been so well described by the Honourable Miss Lawless in her pathetic story of Hurrish. Up to the close of the 16th century, there seems to have been only one road leading through Burren, and now, unless along the coastline, it is no easy matter to travel over this part of Ireland. These highlands afforded a safe refuge to the pre-Celtic race when they were driven westward by the more highly civilised Celt in his advance from the east. How well these people defended their lands may be learned from the investigations of my friend Mr. T.J. Westrop, who has discovered the remains of about 200 pre-Celtic forts in this part of County Clare. In close proximity with these remains, some of the work of earliest Christian settlers in Ireland still exist, rude in the extreme and said to have been built by the same hands as those which erected the forts above referred to. Pagans and Christians dwelt side by side, the sentiments of the former largely influencing the people of this part of Ireland up to within comparatively recent times. For instance, in the middle of the 17th century, we are informed that the Archbishop of Toom had to cross over to the Isles of Arran to destroy the oak figure of Macdara which the people then worshipped in spite of all the clergy could do to induce them to abandon the adoration of this idol. At the present time, Irish men and women living in the west of the Shannon are full of the folklore and ideas derived from their ancestors. County Clare has no seaport, town or bay of sufficient depth and magnitude to afford protection to modern vessels. Excepting Ennis, with its 6,000 inhabitants, there are no important towns or many large villages in Clare. It is covered with hamlets in which small farmers and tradesmen reside, being essentially an agricultural district. Regarding the race or stock from which the inhabitants of Clare were derived, there are certain anatomical peculiarities which characterise various pure races of men, among these is the shape of their skulls. In some ancient burying places in Ireland we find, with human remains, rude earthen vessels, flint arrowheads, bone pins and shells, but no bronze or iron instruments, and we therefore conclude that these articles were used by people who lived and died before the present era because it was not long before Christianity was introduced into Ireland that bronze and iron instruments were freely exported from the continent into that country and would have been used and buried in the graves of the people above referred to had they lived some time after the commencement of the Christian era. Together with the flint arrowheads and bone pins, we find the crania of the individuals who used these primitive weapons. And these skulls are characteristic in shape, being, in relation to their breadth, much elongated from before backwards. Skulls of a precisely similar form, together with the same kind of bone and flint instruments, have been found in many parts of Europe, including Spain, 
especially in the Basque provinces, where at present the inhabitants have not only traits of character similar to those possessed, so far as we can judge, by the ancient inhabitants of Clare, but the conformation of their skulls and features are believed to be identical with those of the prehistoric people of Ireland. In this way we are led to think that the Basques of Spain, a remnant of the old Iberian race of Europe, are derived from the same stock as that which overran Ireland in former times, the pre-Celtic people of Ireland having been, to a large extent, Iberians, who probably passed over from Spain into Ireland. Professor Boyd Dawkins observes that Erin, Ireland, the land of Erna, Ivernian, Ibernian, is merely a variant of Iberia, and that the name of the great island of the Western Ocean and the southwestern peninsula of Europe is due to their having been occupied by the same race, a race so clearly marked off from all others as to be known by the same name. Tradition refers to this long-skulled race as having been rather under the average height, with brown or grey eyes and curly dark hair, a type to be found in considerable numbers among the people of Clare at the present day. The ancient inhabitants of Ireland from the earliest times were recognised as Iberians, and, as we learn from the life of St. Senan, were known in central Clare as the Baskin tribe. The Iberian race, or Fearbolucs, as they are called in the ancient records and traditions of Ireland, have left us something more than their bones. They lived on until long after the invasion of Ireland by the Celts, and many of their massive stone forts still exist in Clare. Mr. T.J. Westrop, in the September number of the Journal of the Royal Society of Antiquaries of Ireland, has described and given us the ground plan of two of these forts. Some of the most perfect and remarkable work of these people is to be found on the Isles of Arran, at the entrance of Galway Bay. As the Celts advanced from the east, the Iberian chiefs of Ireland were driven westward. One of these chiefs, Angus by name, took up his abode on the Isles of Arran. His brother, Adar, fixed his home in the centre of Clare, on the lands subsequently occupied by our sept. This chief died and was buried within two miles of the site of Quinn Abbey, and the mound over his remains still exist in a perfect state of preservation. It is known as my Ardor, and will be frequently referred to in the following pages as being the spot on which the chiefs of the Dalcassian tribe were inaugurated kings of Thomond. Our knowledge of the Irish Iberians is very imperfect. When we first have cognizance of their existence in that country, they had passed from their primitive state and developed into a people under the leadership of chiefs. Their consanguine, near and remote, were classified into categories, and in conversation they addressed one another by terms of relationship and not by personal names. At the time of the Celtic invasion of Ireland, these people made a vigorous effort to resist the foreigners and appear to have been led on more than one occasion by female warriors. One of them is referred to in the Celtic poem as follows. The valley where the lovely foss fell, from her, as ancient Irish records tell, obtained the name Glan Fais, by which name it is known at the present time. Scota, the widow of a chief of Munster, was also slain in an engagement with the Aryan invaders. And in the footnote, we learn from Holland's Head, Chronicles, that it was from this Scota, or Scotach, that the early Irish were known as Scots, a name subsequently given by the Iberian and Celtic settlers in the north of Britain to Scotland, the land of Scota. Returning to the text, Towards the end of the first century of our era, the fear bollocks rose against the Celts. They had still a chief in Connacht who was of sufficient importance to receive the Celtic king of Ireland, but having invited the king and his attendants into his fort, the fear bollock chief slew the whole of them and then seized the government of Ireland. Their reign, however, was of short duration, 
for the Celts soon recovered their power and slaughtered or drove out of the country great numbers of the old race. It was at this period that Angus sought refuge in the Isles of Arran. From this history we learn that the Iberian stock were still powerful and numerous in Ireland at the commencement of the Christian era, and we shall find that in the district now known as County Clare, these people were not conquered by the Celts until the end of the 4th or beginning of the 5th century. The Isles of Arran, the descendants of the old Iberian stock, have probably existed with less intermixations of race than in most other districts of Ireland, except perhaps in parts of Burren, and within the past few years Professor Haddon and C. R. Brown of Dublin have visited these Ireland and reported concerning the people. They state that at present the inhabitants of the Isles of Arran, Galway, are still largely a peculiar and exclusive race, although mixed with Irish men who have come from the mainland. The men are short and slight, but athletic in build. Their average height is 5 feet 4 and 3 quarter inches, whereas Irish men average 5 feet 8 and a half inches. Their hands are small, with short span, and their forearm is often unusually long. Their head is well shaped, long and narrow, but viewed from above, their sides are slightly bulging, not flat. The height above the ears is considerable, and the top well arched. The forehead is broad, upright, and rarely receding, though not high as a rule, and the superciliary ridges of the brow that is to say, the bone over the eyes, are not prominent. The face being remarkably long and oval, the chin long and narrow but not angular. The eyes are rather small, close together and marked at the outer corners by transverse wrinkles. The irises are mostly blue or blue-grey, the nose long, straight and pointed. The lower lip is rather large and full. The ears are not large, but stand well out from the head. In many of the men, the length of nose and chin appears decidedly great. The complexion is clear and ruddy, but seldom freckled. Their hair is brown, mostly light brown, and the beard often reddish. On the whole, they are decidedly good looking. Their sight and hearing is singularly acute. Dr. Keane states that on a clear day, any of them could discern with the naked eye a small black sailing boat at Blackhead, 20 miles distant, before he could see it with his binocular. Some of them live to a great age, and the births exceed the deaths, but the population is decreasing owing to emigration. A tombstone in Killini records the death of one who lived 119 years. They are exceptionally honest, straightforward and upright in their dealings, and illegitimacy is almost unknown. Mr. P. Leister, a magistrate of these Ireland states, quote, The Aran Irelanders are, as a body, extremely well-behaved and industrious people. If there are disputes among them, it is in connection with lands. There are very few cases of drunkenness. I have known two months elapse without a single case being brought before me. For four years, I have not sent more than six or seven persons to jail without the option of a fine. There is no jail on the island. Theft is very rare. I only remember one case of positive stealing sent for trial. End quote. They are singularly unmusical, no piper, fiddler or musician of any sort being on the islands. Irish is their language, but English can be understood and spoken with strangers. Most of the weddings occur just before Lent, and there is no courtship, the young man going straight to the house of an eligible girl and asking her to marry him. If refused, he goes elsewhere, and a man has been known to ask three girls the same evening before he was accepted. Wakes are held even for those who die abroad. At one time, a funeral procession would be stopped on the road and the mourners would raise small piles of stones. A corpse is always led out through the back door for the Aaronites believe in fairies, banshees and ghosts. 
if at the marriage any one repeats the benediction after the priest and ties a knot on a string at the mention of each of the sacred names, the marriage will be childless for 15 years until the string is burned. Pin wells and rag bushes are still frequented and on the night before emigrating people will sleep in the open beside one of the holy wells in order to have good fortune where they go. The evil eye is believed in and certain days are counted unlucky so that even burials do not take place on them. Mr. Webster lived for many years among the Basques who are the descendants of the Iberian inhabitants of Spain. He states that as a pure race they are only to be found in the mountain ranges of the Spanish Pyrenees, that their skulls are long from before backwards and flat from side to side, that their faces are long and oval with a good angle. The Basques have blue or blue-grey eyes, brown hair and fair complexions. The large majority of the young men are good-looking fellows. They have a remarkably upright carriage. The Basque is under the average height, but is a strong, wiry creature capable of undergoing any amount of hard work. If we compare the description of the Basques with that of many of the people inhabiting the Isles of Arran and Burren, we shall find that from an anthropological point of view, they are almost identical. And in the Isles of Arran, the most extensive works of the pre-Celtic people of Ireland exists. Mr. Webster observes that the Basque language has great powers of assimilation and freely takes vocabularies of other languages. Max Müller is of the opinion that it is one of the best representatives of the Turanian type of language. Until the year 1833, the Basques of Spain were an absolutely free people, governed by their own laws and chiefs, who, with their acclades, were elected by the people as their leaders and judges. Every man's home was his sanctuary, into which neither the law nor any other power might intrude. Nor could any action be initiated against a man until he had stated his case before constituted authorities. It was then either dismissed or sent on for adjudication. They levied their own taxes and of their free will granted a contingent of soldiers and sailors for the services of the Crown of Castile upon the distinct understanding that their national customs and laws were to remain inviolate. In fact, they transferred their allegiance from the King of Navarre to Castile in the 12th and 13th centuries because the former sovereign attempted to tamper with their Führers or ancient rights. These much-prized Führers have not, so far as we know, been compiled or carefully studied, but they related chiefly to the tenure of land the Basques being essentially an agricultural people, living in hamlets scattered over their valleys and mountains and abhorring the idea of an approach to town life or mercantile pursuits. Those of them, however, who resided near the coast are excellent and intrepid sailors. The third Earl of Carnarvon, who was born in the year 1800 and grew up to be fond of adventure and foreign travel, being an excellent linguist, states that he resided for some time in the Basque provinces before the year 1833, when they were still a free people and living under their own laws and institutions. He observes that every man had a right to state his own case before constituted authorities when accused, or as defendant, and that this was a right far more precious than even the habeas corpus is with us, and was thoroughly appreciated by these people. Lord Carnarvon states that in 1833 the Basques rose to a man against Queen Isabella of Spain in her attempt to destroy the Führers, and so, he observes, they, quote, were pronounced rebels by Her Majesty's ministers, and the ancient law of their country was to be swamped and superseded by the common law of Spain, and this measure was carried by an arbitrary edict of a government of yesterday, end quote. It is well to quote Lord Carnarvon's opinion regarding the character of the Basque people because it seems that we are justified in maintaining that the pre-Celtic inhabitants at any rate of that part of Ireland with which we are now concerned and the Basques were derived from the same Iberian stock. Of the character of these ancient people we can only now collect dim rays of light. But 
at the present time we have many of their descendants with us, a mixed race to some extent in the case of the inhabitants of the Isles of Arran, but almost pure and allowed to develop under their own laws and institutions in the Basque province up to the time that Lord Carnarvon lived among them. He writes that they inhabited a free land and were men deserving freedom and continues, quote, the erect, not haughty carriage, the buoyant step and the whole bearing of the men spoke of liberty long enjoyed, well understood and therefore not abused. Such men were the Basques, trained to habits of self-reliance by centuries of self-government, fine men in spirit, not in name alone, drinking in with their mother's milk a love of justice and a reverence for law, in thought sober yet independent and wholly without fear, except the honest fear of doing wrong, models of ancient manners and not unfrequently of manly beauty, faithful friends, generous hosts, following with fervour, but without intolerance, their father's fate, they were the Tyrolese of Spain, and I might add, the flower of Europe, lambs in the hour of peace, yet heroes in the field. With them, the household charities and patriotism went hand in hand, in them the honest, yet the kindest spirit, the mildest, yet the proudest virtues were combined. Never, perhaps, existed a more perfect union of the qualities which should adorn a people. The idolatry of freedom so distinctive of the Swiss, and the unconquerable affection of the Tyrolese to his princes, were, by a happy and most unusual combination, united in the Basques. They adhere with tenacity to the soil of their birth. No prospect of advantage or promotion can induce him to abandon his home. He is ready to make any sacrifice or incur any danger in defence of his home. The ties of kindred are peculiarly strong, nevertheless. The mother of a cherished family has been known without a summons to replace her lost husband in the ranks of Don Carlos's army by one, two or even her third and only remaining boy. End quote. There is much in this passage which reminds us of the character of the Irish west of the Shannon. From their history we shall learn that they likewise fought and strove for centuries to preserve their Führers, their ancient laws, government and lands. It is true the Iberians of Ireland were conquered by the Celts, but it is equally certain that they were far from having been exterminated. The fear bollocks not only lived on in west of Ireland, but they intermarried with the Celts, and the mixed race must have influenced to a considerable extent the social and political life of the inhabitants of Connacht, including County Clare. The Celts passed over from the continent of Europe into Ireland and conquered the Iberian inhabitants of that country. I have referred to the elongated form of skull of the Iberian race. The crania of the Celts, on the other hand, was broad in proportion to their length from before backwards, and in the burrows containing such skulls, iron and bronze instruments are found, which take the place of the bone weapons of the earlier inhabitants of Ireland. Colonel Wood Martin believes that iron and Christianity were introduced into Ireland within an approximately short period of each other. For although iron may, in small quantities, have found its way into that country through the ordinary channels of commerce then open at or just before the commencement of the Christian era. Yet iron ingots or iron articles so acquired would be comparatively few in number. It may be well to state that the Irish Celts belonged principally to the old Aryan or Godelic type. They were a fair-haired, grey or blue-eyed race, tall, well-developed, handsome fellows. We have the authority of Professor Seuss for asserting that their language, together with that of the Greeks, Teutons and Slavs, belonged to the Aryan race, or rather, that they spoke a pure Aryan language. Subsequent to the invasion of England by the Godelic Celts, a later inroad, Brythonic, of this race occurred. 
but these latter Celts did not pass into Ireland. There the old and pure Aryan stock remained, speaking a language the vestiges of which exist in the Erse, Manx and Gaelic tongue. We hear of the Celts at one time as being a powerful nation in Europe, who pressed hard upon the Greek and Roman empires, but who almost suddenly disappeared from the family of Western nations, crushed by the Romans under Caesar and the Germans who invaded their territory from the east. In England the Celt was driven back into Wales and the highlands of Scotland, where he has dwelt and continues to live and multiply up to the present day. The German historian Mommsen, in his History of Rome, concerning the Celts of Europe, observes, quote, that in the mighty vortex of the world's history, which invariably crushes all nations that are not as hard as steel, such a people could not permanently maintain themselves. With reason, the Celt of the continent suffered the same fate at the hands of the Romans as their kinsmen in Ireland suffer down to our day at the hands of the Saxons. The fate of becoming merged as a leaven of future development in a politically superior nationality. End quote. Monsot Thierry, the historian of the Gallic Celts, from an historical point of view, gained an intimate knowledge of these people, and I have placed his opinion side by side with those of Momsen regarding the congenital character of the Celt. Momsen, 1. The whole ancient world presents no more genuine knight. 2. The incapacity to attain or even to tolerate any organisation either military or political. 3. Laziness in culture of the fields. 4. Love of ostentation. 5. Extravagant credulity. 6. Inclination to rise in revolt under the first chance leader. 7. Irresolute and fervid. 8. Clever. 9. A delight in singing and a talent for poetry and rhetoric. 10. In a political point of view, thoroughly useless as a nation. Theory 1. Personal bravery unequalled among ancient nations. 2. A marked dislike to the idea of discipline and order. 3. Want of perseverance. 4. Extreme ostentation. 5. Open to all impressions. 6. Perpetual dissensions. 7. Extreme susceptibility, impetuous and excessively vain. 8. Remarkably intelligent. 9. A free spirit. 10. As a nation, the personal sentiment, the idea of self, far too much developed. Momsen adds that the Celt was remarkable for his childlike piety, unsurpassed fervour of national feeling and the closeness with which those who are fellow countrymen cling together almost like one family in opposition to a stranger. Dr Ritchie, who was Professor of Feudal and English Law in the University of Dublin and to whose admirable history of the Irish people we are so much indebted for our knowledge on this subject, states that in his opinion the admitted failure of the Celtic race is not so much attributable to the inferiority of their organisation as to the fact of their possessing a highly organised and sensitive disposition. They are therefore extremely susceptible of emotions and perceptions and apt to arrive at rapid conclusions which are not always lasting. They shrink against the staying power of the German race, the Celts' ideas being too often matured before the Saxon has mastered even the premises on which his opinions are founded. The stolid, persevering and fixed purpose of the Saxon has and must prevail over the light-hearted, sensitive and comparatively indolent Celt. Dr. Ritchie, like Momsen, dilates on the remarkably tenacious feeling which the Celt has for his fellow countrymen, his family, and when they existed, for his chiefs. And the Reverend Dr. Todd in his Life of St. Patrick observes that the quote, key note of Irish history is the spirit of clanship 
among Irish men, together with adhesion to ancient rites. End quote. Robert Knox of Edinburgh, in his work on the races of men, states that the Celt was made for the game of war, and that herein lies the strength of his physical and moral character. In structure and weight, he is inferior to the Saxon. In muscular energy and rapidity of action, he surpasses all other European races. Caterus Paribus, that is, Weight for weight, age for age, stature for stature, the Celts are the strongest of men. Zealous in point of honour, admitting of no practical jokes, admirer of the fine arts, his taste is excellent and his ear good. Full of deep sympathies, dreamers on the past, gallant and brave, they are not more courageous but more warlike. Than other races. Before leaving this subject, we may refer to the closing history of a typical Celtic chief drawn by Mumson, who was not likely to flatter the Celt. He writes as follows Caesar having invaded Gaul from the south and the Germans from the east, the Celts of Gaul were almost completely subjugated. In the year BC 53, there was little left to them beyond Brittany, and there, under the gallant leadership of one of their chiefs, Acco, they for some time resisted the Romans, but at length their stronghold, Veneti, fell. Acco was taken prisoner and executed by the Romans. This act was sufficient to rouse the whole Celtic people to revolt, and they elected Vercingetorix as their chief. He, despairing of defeating the Romans in the open field, determined to mobilize a large force of cavalry and by its means destroy the enemy's supply of food and to cut off his means of communication with Italy. Vercingetorix abandoned all weak places of defense and concentrated his efforts on strengthening those points he believed he could hold with success. In this way, he defended Borges inflicting terrible losses on the Romans. For some time, Caesar's position in Gaul was extremely precarious. He failed to capture Gregoria, although he was himself in command of the siege operations. This defeat, the first Caesar in person had ever suffered, gave great encouragement to the Celts. On the other hand, the Romans became disheartened and at a council of war, Caesar was advised to retire into Italy. This he refused to do, and by a rapid concentration of his army and enormous personal exertions, he at length succeeded in shutting up Vercingetorix and a large portion of his army in the fortified town of Elysia. The Romans invested the place for 10 miles and completely cut off the supplies of the 80,000 men within its walls. Vercingetorix dismissed his cavalry and they managed to make their way through the Roman lines and although 250,000 Celts collected for the relief of Alesia, the Romans had, in the meantime, rendered their position impregnable. Alesia fell and with it the Celtic nation. The defeated Celts were allowed to disperse because Vercingetorix refused to take flight, but decided in a council of war that since he had not succeeded in breaking off the alien yoke, he was ready to give himself up as a victim and to avert as far as possible the destruction of his people by bringing it onto his own head. And this was done. The Celtic officers delivered their chief, the solemn choice of the whole nation, to the enemy of their country for such punishment as might be thought fit. Mounted on his steed in full armour, the chief appeared before the Roman proconsul and rode round his tribunal. Then he surrendered his horse and arms and sat down in silence at Caesar's feet. Five years afterwards he was led in triumph 
marched through the streets of Rome. And while his conqueror was offering solemn thanks to the gods on the summit of the capital, Vercingetorix was beheaded at the base of the hill. Mommsen adds, quote, As after a day of gloom, the sun breaks through the clouds at its setting, so destiny bestows on nations in their decline a last great man. The whole ancient world presents no more genuine knight than Vercingetorix, the Celtic chief. End quote. From the evidence referred to, we may form a fairly accurate idea of the congenital nature of the people from which our sept was derived. No question, their chiefs were almost pure Celts, being adverse to mixed marriages. The Iberians, however, were a comely race, and the marriage tie, if it existed in early times, was a very elastic one among our ancestors in the west of Ireland. There can be no question as to the extensive intermarriage of the Iberians and their Celtic conquerors, for in their ancient burying places skulls are found indicating a mixed race, and the same Iberio-Celtic form of skull is characteristic of the great majority of the crania of the agricultural population of Clare at the present time. Nor have these people any reason to be ashamed of their ancestors, as the preceding pages demonstrate. The two races from which they have sprung possessed many virtues, and doubtless had their failings. Their combined qualities afford us the material on which to base our ideas as to the character inherent in our ancestors and their history may lead us to reflect as to the paramount importance which their congenital qualities had in shaping their course through many generations. In the two succeeding chapters, we must refer as briefly as possible to somewhat technical details concerning the social and political conditions under which our ancestors lived from the earliest times until well into the 16th century. Knowledge of this kind, however, is necessary to enable us to comprehend the life and subsequent history of the inhabitants of County Clare, or, for that matter, of any part of the south or west of Ireland. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, chapter one of a story of an Irish sept, their character and struggle to maintain their lands by Charles Nottage McNamara, a member of the Sept. Um, quite interesting stuff covered in this first chapter. But as I said before, this merely just lays the foundation for what's to come next. And I'm really even more excited to share the following chapters with you. So um, I can't say when this is going to happen. I hope it happens within the next week. Might take two weeks to put it together, maybe sooner. But the next one, we're going to talk about Breton Law. So I'm sure any of the followers of this channel are really going to enjoy what we cover in chapter two. Um, if you are watching this after the live stream and I didn't get a chance to answer any of your questions in the chat room, please post them in the comments below and I will definitely get back to them. Uh, also, if you enjoyed this content, please like it, please share it, please subscribe to the channel and uh, pass it on to anybody who you know who might like it, especially if you know any McNamara's or O'Brien's. I think they're really going to love this series of videos. So thank you for your time this evening. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to jump over to the brehenacademy.org website, sign up there, and you can download a copy of this book as well. Until next time, Slonga Fall. Mm -hmm.